Um, today we will be talking about the uh, <coughs> uh, identities. Uh, the identities play an important role in the uh, Eastern Christian traditions as probably in any religious or non-religious tradition. Essentially, traditions ride on the identities. They draw um, uh, strength from the identity from uh, from the identities, and uh, identities are also a weak point of any tradition because they apply traditions to a certain setting to a certain framework. So identity and tradition are in the intertwined, uh, and this is also the case in the Eastern Christian. In the Eastern Christian traditions, we have a distinct set of identities. Uh, uh, when, when, when we compare those identities with identities pertinent to the Western Christian traditions, there are some commonalities and there are also some differences. Uh, so we are going to uh, look into the Eastern Christian identities and we will see how they function and they, we see how, how they uh, uh, uphold the tradition or their traditions. Uh, identity is an, inter an interesting phenomenon. It's, uh, it's a new concept, it's a new notion. Some people ascribe this notion to the postmodern framework, framework of thinking, right? Um, and uh, it's interesting that even those Christian traditions that reject postmodern framework of thinking, they still write very much on the identities, on the idea of the identity. So, on the one hand, they re reject uh, many things from the postmodern framework. On the other hand, they embark on many things without really noticing that. So, it's one of the uh, one of the paradoxes of, of uh, implementing, of bringing traditions to the modern time, to the modernity. And it is a source of, of uh, one of the sources of the tensions between the uh, Christian traditions, whether they are Eastern or Western, with the modernity. Uh, we will consider the tensions, these tensions, in due time. Uh, I will just uh, mention this briefly. About this tension right now, uh, and it is necessary to say this when we are talking about the identities. Because, as I said, identity is very much a construct that stems from the postmodern way of thinking. Uh, when we speak about particular uh, Eastern Christian identities, uh, I thought what we should start with, and I thought that probably we should start with uh, uh, with presenting them as a cloud. Just imagine a cloud of text, right? A cloud of notions, old exams. Remember, last time we were talking about the language as a construct that help us to understand, to immerse into traditions. So imagine a vocabulary. A list of lexemes or a cloud of identities. And uh, let us look into this cloud and let us consider those identities one by one. Remember last time, uh, last Tuesday, I mentioned uh, uh, an, an early Christian author who lived in the second century, Theophilus of Antioch. He was talking about the two kinds of sight, two kinds of eyes. The eyes that see the visible things and the eyes that see the invisible things. Uh, you will come across many references to the ancient authors when you read Eastern Christian literature. Because the, what we call the fathers of the church are crucially important for, uh, uh, for the Eastern Christian traditions. They are actually constituting those identities. Nowadays, we 
of course, we use more inclusive language. We don't speak only about the fathers of the church, but we also speak about the mothers of the, of the church. And in fact, there were some female voices, quite strong ones, in the ancient times. There were some brilliant hymnographers like Cassia. Uh, uh, there were some uh, very powerful women and theologians like Theodora, the wife of the Emperor Justinian. And uh, of course, it was not very common that women wrote, still they did. And for instance, the wife of the Emperor Alexis Komnenos, uh, Anna Komnenos, she wrote a wonderful piece of uh, uh, memoirs about his father. And it is really a masterpiece of. Uh, of, the, of the Byzantine writing. So, uh, uh, in some sense, if, even if, if we compare uh, the situation in the East and in the West, in the late antiquity or Middle Ages, with the position of women, we see that the Eastern situation was more flexible. For instance, it was absolutely normal for a woman to become an emperor, an empress. And it was absolutely unthinkable in the West. Hence was, for instance, the tension between the Charlemagne and the Byzantine emperors. Because when Irini, the empress, became the empress in Constantinople, well, for Charlemagne, it was absolutely unacceptable. That's, that's why he dealt it early legitimacy as an uh, empress. But it was absolutely fine for the East. So uh, it is uh, uh, true, and it is that, that, that the women played important role in the East, and that's why. Even when we talk about the fathers of the church, of ethnicities, uh, the discipline, the studies, the fathers of the church, we also include women into, uh, into this category. And uh, the Byzantines this mind, would not mind that, uh, certainly. Uh, so, patristics uh, is an important source of authority for. Uh, 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 for the Eastern Christian tradition, we should say, it, it, to put it very simply, it's certainly an oversimplification. While for the Roman Church, the ultimate source of authority is the code, well, it's speaking very roughly, okay? Uh, there are many nuances in this, in this statement. For the Protestant Church, it is the scripture. For the Orthodox Church, it is the arts. Well, to put it very roughly. Okay. Uh, and because uh, and certainly the, the students of the phenomenon of tradition, tradition has been studied as a philosophical social phenomenon, they have noticed that the idea of the tradition and the idea of the identity, they are connected with the idea of authority. So they contribute to authority. In order for authority to be accepted, one has to have a certain identity. If I identify, for instance, myself with the Eastern Christian tradition, then it is much easier for me to accept the authority of the fathers, which is constitutive for this tradition, than for anyone who does not identify him or herself with a uh, certain identity. Okay? That's why the fathers constitute an important identity for the Eastern tradition. So, so you're saying um, if the Eastern um, tradition then it's easier for you? Yeah, that's right. Well, the fathers, as they call it. For instance, for us, uh, for the Eastern Christians, uh, it's not by default that we accept the authority of the popes. We accept the authority of the popes only when they're holy and they did make mistakes, right? But the authority of the fathers is higher for us, even, even the authority of the popes. For the Roman Catholic tradition, it's slightly different, but again, it depends who the Roman Catholic. There are some Jesuits, obviously, who uh, probably put it, uh, put it differently. Uh, uh, well, it's interesting thing about this patristic identity that even though uh, patristics is so important for us that it, it constitutes an, an, an identity of the Eastern Christians, we don't really study the fathers <coughs> very much. If you go to uh, the patristic conference, there are some good of them. For instance, there is a famous Oxford Christian conference, which happens every four years in Oxford. I, well, I, I, I've been going there since um, 16 years ago or so. And we, the Easterners, constitute a tiny minority at the conference. Imagine 800 people, and maybe 
a few, a few dozens of the Eastern Christians who consider the fathers uh, as ultimate authority and identity for themselves. So it's, it's another paradox of our tradition that we rely very much on this idea of the fathers and we don't really study them. If, we, if you compare the translations of the patristic texts from the uh, Greek, Latin, Syriac, or uh, Ethiopian, or Armenian, and so forth into English, they are much more than the, the translations of the uh, of these texts into Russian, for instance. Uh, so it's uh, uh, it, it all it, this this strange thing, this paradox, also already hints that uh, there is something strange about the identity, the very idea of identity, our conscience in the tradition. We will see more strange things in the idea of identity as we proceed and we consider other identities. Another one is the Oriental one. Well, this one is also sometimes called Eastern and Oriental. Essentially, it is the same. Eastern and Oriental is the same. Oriental is the Latin word uh, for the East. And uh, this identity indicates that we consider ourselves as belonging to the global east, to the east. We identify ourselves with a certain part of the world. Uh, and uh, for many people, this is a very crucial identity. For many people, it is the only important identity in my own tradition. Uh, it has been a debate since, uh, well, since at least, well, 19th century, uh, a debate between the so-called Westerners and Orientals in Russia, in Greece, in other Eastern Christian countries that find their civilizational code, try to find their civilizational code, try to define who they are and what they are. There are still very uh, intense debates on this issue. And the essence of the debate is whether we are, we belong to the East or West is also a part of our culture. West, West is also a part of our identity. If you see the developments nowadays, for instance, in Russia, the political developments, they're very much developing around the same idea. Whether Russia is Eurasia, it means the East, or is also the West. And the entire politics develops around this identity. It is crucially important. And it stems from religion. It stems from the self-identification of the Eastern Orthodox. Okay? Even though it is it projects itself to the secular uh, plane, people who don't associate themselves with any religion, they still regard themselves in the terms of East West whether they are Easterners, or Orientals, or Westerners. Again, there is a slight uh, difference between the Oriental and the Eastern. Sometimes, Oriental, we call those who, uh, who, are, who do not go back to the Byzantine times, like Syrians, Armenians, uh, Ethiopians, Copts in Egypt, those people, those traditions, they descended from the Byzantine tradition of the past millennium. They rejected self-identification self as Byzantine. And they continue to do so even now. And they have a special kind of edition of the Oriental of what of Eastern. Identity, which is called Oriental. We call them Orientals, and they call themselves Orientals. They're pretty happy about that. Uh, those churches who never broke up with Byzantium, with the Byzantine tradition, they call themselves Easterners, Eastern churches. They are like Greek church, Russian church, Georgian church, Serbian, Bulgarians, and so forth. Okay? So you see that, that even within the same identity, you have differentiations. And you have conflicts. Uh, even though the meaning of both identities is the same, it's about the peace. 
nowadays, this identity has no sense because the world has become globalized. And what is Eastern nowadays? Can one define what is the East? Say, there are churches, there is a, 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 a strong Orthodox church in Japan, which was established a hundred years ago. They have given a district in Tokyo, which is called Nikolai Do, named after the founder of the Japanese church in, in Japan. In Japan. Uh, uh, he was a Russian bishop, Nikolai Kasapkin. Uh, so, who are the Eastern churches for Japan? Are they Eastern churches? Because they're in the West. Uh, from Japan, right? Or who are the American Orthodox? They uh, increasingly reject to call themselves diaspora. They say we are the local people, we are Americans. We don't want to associate ourselves with Antioch or with Greece or with Russia or whatever. And uh, can you call them Easterners? In which sense is America the East? Are they the Eastern posters or Western posters? It's no sense, you see. Uh, so those identities, particularly this identity of the Eastern Church, doesn't work anymore. That's why even the very title of our course, the Eastern Christian Traditions, is somehow misleading. Because it tells more about the identity than about the reality. The real situation is that those traditions are not Eastern anymore. Yes, they stem, they develop, they came from the East. But they are not Eastern anymore, and they don't want increasingly, they don't want to identify themselves with the East. They say we are global, we are Americans, we are Japanese, we are African. Uh, there is a huge nation in Africa as well. Who are they? They don't certainly want to identify themselves as Eastern. Uh, so, another identity and another problem that we have with this identity. Uh, then, another identity that we have is that we consider ourselves the Church of the Consuls, the Conciliar Church. Uh, this is somehow a rela relatively recent identity, which has been articulated, uh, it was articulated in the first half of the 19th century by a Russian thinker, Alexei Konyakov. Uh, to uh, try to figure out what is the distinct, distinct feature of the of the policy. What makes it what makes it different from the Protestants, from the Catholics, from the Anglicans? And he suggested that it is conciliarity, which makes the Eastern tradition different from all the all the rest uh, of uh, the rest of the traditions. It particularly means that. Uh, we well very much on the councils. Councils are extremely important for us. That the councils of the church constitute the ultimate authority for the church, together with the fathers. But even if, they, if we take the fathers, the councils define who are the who are the fathers to, to whom we should address. Okay, so the councils constitute the ultimate authority. It has to do with the medieval. Western controversies about the role of the councils in the church and the role of the popes. Uh, you probably know that there were uh, uh, tendencies in the West to also to elevate the meaning, the significance of the councils, the so called conciliarists. Yes, please. You are the councils in church. Yes, councils of the church. Uh, you mean what is the council? Yeah. yeah. Well, the councils of the church are gatherings, all the bishops from all parts of the church who come together to a certain place to discuss issues pertinent to the uh, current situation. Say, we have a dogmatic issue, we have doubts about a certain dogmatic question, and we don't know what to do with, it, with this. Who is right when he, or sometimes she, states something about a certain dogmatic issue? That is how the council to decide. So the councils the bishops from all the church came together and they discussed this, those issues and decided this is right. And hence then, uh, that issue became a dogma, became a teaching of the church. Yes, please. Um, would that be similar to like a synod in Catholic Catholicism? Like 
Yeah, a bit, but there is a difference. Uh, it's almost like, uh, just imagine the parliament, which has a legislative power. If a parliament passes a law, a decision, that decision becomes a law obligated for everyone, regardless whether I agree or disagree, okay? In the same sense, the councils also have the same authority to impose a decision which would be obligatory for everyone. Uh, now it comes to the synods in the Catholic Church, which is a, a recent uh, uh, institution. Uh, I think it was introduced by uh, and promoted mostly by John Paul II in, uh, in the aftermath of the aftermath of the Vatican II, in order to elevate this institution, which was somehow neglected in the Catholic Church. And the prevailing idea about the councils in the Catholic Church, which applies also to the synods, is that there is a council, there is a synod, but there is a pope about the council and the synod. So if Paul, but the pope says, no, this is not right, the council cannot override this decision of the pope. For us, it is not the case. If the council says yes, then even if pope says no, we don't, we, we don't take into consideration the <coughs> what the Pope says. So the councils are more important for us than the Pope. Actually, the word synod is absolutely the same. It's just a Greek word for the word council. They are absolutely the same words. Okay? Any question? Good. So, and this idea of conciliarity now works as an identity. Not just as an, as an institution, an institution of decision making, but also as an identity. Just imagine, a, say, a state, which is a parliamentary republic. So the parliament for such a state works not just as a legislative uh, institution, but also as an institution, as an institution that gives identity, provides an identity for the state, for the republic. Okay. In the same sense, uh, the councils also provides an identity for us. We identify ourselves as the Church of the Councils. And we, we, we speak about conciliarity, uh, which in Russian renders as sobornost. This is a Russian word. In Greek, it would, it would say katholikotis, katholikotita, which has to do with the Catholic word. Catholic means uh, around the globe. It means that the bishops from around the globe come to the council in order to take decisions. Okay? But again, there is a problem with this identity. Uh, because we have been unable to, uh, to summon a council for several centuries. We tried to, we had lost councils which were more or less uh, more or less uh, global uh, in the in the 14th century. Now there are still discussions whether whether to consider those councils as global. Uh, but since then, we haven't had any council which would confirm our identity. We tried to summon such a council just three months ago, actually less than three, three months. You probably heard about the final post council, which was held in Greece in June. It was very much on the news. Uh, and this was a good attempt to gather all the Orthodox churches to one place, and it, it partially failed. Four of the 14, 14, 14 churches didn't come the Church of Russia, the Church of Georgia, um, Bulgaria, and Antioch. They didn't come, they didn't show up. Which shook our own self-esteem, our own self-identification. So there is a problem with this identity as well. It is important for us, but it doesn't work often. It does not work when we want it to work. Yes, yes. Why do you want to work? Sorry? Why do you want it to work? All different reasons. Uh, we will have a discussion on this. We'll have a topic uh, on the panel for Council. Just to say a few words, there were political reasons, uh, so that this council 
faced a problem which was a projection of the political problems of the Russian Federation with the rest of the world. Okay. And uh, there were churches that had mutual quarrels. For instance, the Church of Antioch didn't come because they had a quarrel with the Church of Jerusalem over a time in Qatar, and they claimed each of them jurisdiction over that tiny community that it belongs to me. And it has to do actually to a wider context of the Israeli Palestinian conflict. So, again, a political context that included the uh, council to be uh, reformed. Okay. So, this is another identity which is quite problematic. There is another identity which is quite recent and which we like, is the so called personalist identity. Uh, there are some theologians who say that you see it. We, the Easterners, are different from the Westerners. And what is the difference is that we believe in the personality, in the personhood. The Westerners, they believe in the nature. So they actually, those theologians, they counterpose the nature to the person. Uh, they say, well, personhood, the human uh, personality is central for our tradition. While all those obsessions, you know, all that obsession with uh, money, capital, with uh, sexuality, and so forth, which exists in the West, it has to do with the nature, and the West is not personal, but person-centric, so to say, so to say, right? And they build an entire identity on this counterposition between the nature and the person. Uh, it is a continuation somehow of the identity, Eastern identity for them. They say, Eastern it is personal, West is about nature. It ignores largely the person. Uh, there is another problem with this identity because these ideas of the person who they borrowed from the West, they were initially developed by the Western philosophers and theologians particularly some leftist Catholic theologians in France and some Americans, there were two, at least two great American schools of personal, one in Boston and another one in California, uh, mostly from the Methodist background, and they developed their own ideas about the personhood, and the Orthodox theologians just borrowed those ideas, sometimes without acknowledging, they just, uh, they just uh, plagiarized, actually. I made a, compar a comparative study of some books of the of those orthodox theologians and found you know just plagiarisms from the Western books. And they said that these these ideas are unwestern. They define, they constitute the Eastern identity. So it's a false identity which uh, still works perfect. Many people believe in it and many people identify themselves with this idea in the in the Eastern traditions. So Another identity and another problem with this identity. Okay? Maybe it's a bit difficult to, to get, right? Yeah, I will explain maybe in time in more detail. Uh, we shouldn't stick now to this, to this uh, idea. But these are the ident identities that are concept that are based on the concepts, on the ideas. There are some philosophers philosophical ideas, which were articulated sometimes in, in heavy philosophical language, articulated quite recently in the 19th century or 20th century, and uh, the Orthodox just identified themselves with those ideas. There were, uh, however, some identities in the past which were less sophisticated. They were based on the personalities, on the uh, figures, historical figures, who uh, led movements, and those movements within the institution world identified, identified themselves with those figures, and the names of those figures became identities for the groups. Sometimes those groups are pretty large, were pretty large. Some of them vanished, some of them still exist, and uh, uh, they still still have the names of the founders and their identities. Let us have a look into uh, this cloud. 
say, let us begin with the early centuries, the Gnostic movement in the second or third century identified itself with one of the leaders of this movement, Valentinus, uh, and they called themselves Valentinians. Sometimes those identities were not those that the people were happy about, but they were ascribed, assigned by the other groups who actually uh, polemicized in the Eastern Church. I belong to a group and I uh, uh, argue about certain dogmatic issues with another group. And that group calls me by the name of my founder, of the founder of my group, and I don't like it. So many identities are those who were ascribed from the side, from the antagonist groups, and they, the people in the group who, uh, who was bearing those identities were not happy. Sometimes it happened that people eventually liked those identities. First they rejected them, and then eventually they accepted them, and they liked them, identified themselves with those things. Uh, so Valentinians were one of them. Arians named after, this is probably the most famous uh, group uh, named by a name of the founder, uh, a presbyter from Alexandria, Arius, uh, who uh, initiated a movement in Alexandria, in Egypt, <coughs> in Egypt, and articulated a doctrine that challenged the entire church. Imagine that approximately 80% of the entire church in the fourth century were Arians. Um, this is a particular identity that worked for that group, and uh, that identity at the time was extremely powerful. And it was absolutely okay for the group to be called Arians. After Arianism was condemned by the first and second ecumenical councils in the fourth century, that name, that identity became pejorative, became bad. Okay? Another identity, Donatists. Uh, that is the uh, thing, the identity that Augustine dealt with a lot. He had a lot of problem, uh, problems with the Donatists. They uh, managed in the, uh, uh, also in the fourth century, continued to exist after the time of Augustine. Well, you probably heard about Augustine, who is the main figure in the Western uh, theology and philosophy, and he actually, his main uh, headache were the Donatists and this Donatist identity. Well, historians, this is a group that emerged in the uh, 5th century as a tiny group named after the historian, the Patriarch of Constantinople, who was condemned as a heretic, but he gave his name to the group that expanded rapidly, that became the major Christian community in Persia, in the Persian Empire. They spread out to India, to China, it became one of the most uh, widely spread Christian group geographically in the uh, period of the Reign of the Approximately up to the 8th, 9th century, they were present in China, in India, they said, in, uh, in the kingdoms of the, uh, of the Middle Asia, and so forth. And that, that group was called historians. It is now hard to de uh, deconstruct this identity. For instance, uh, when we speak about China, the Chinese group, um, uh, it is a tendency now not to use this identity for the group because the identity is misleading eventually, but to call the group Jinjiao, which is a Chinese word means the luminous faith. So, they, so, so this is how the Chinese Christians within the dynasty of Han call themselves, they didn't call themselves historians, but when it comes to the Greek language, for instance, they were happy to be called historians, but in Chinese they call themselves Jin Zhao. Well, another group, Civilites, and after the name of Civil of Alexandria, uh, they were actually the uh, antagonists of the historians, they guys were just the opposite group. And uh, uh, they became actually the mainstream in the Eastern Church, in the Byzantine Church. So the entire Byzantine Church just subscribed to the identity. Me, myself, I personally like this identity very much. But the only identity that I would, I would retain for myself is this one. 
uh, and I'm sitting this up. Uh, so the Jacobites serialized eventually developed into antagonists to this group, Jacobites who did not accept the Council of Chalcedon, and because they were led, led by a figure called Jacob uh, Baradeus, uh, they were called as Jacobites. So another identity which was, was very important for, uh, for the uh, non-Byzantine churches in the first millennium. Still this identity functions. You can call, say, the Syrians Jacobites, they would understand what it means. They don't like it very much, this identity, or at least they don't like to identify themselves now with this identity. But in the past, it, it was a very common identity. Or oh, Theodosians, now completely, uh, completely forgotten identity at that time, in the, say in the uh, 6th century, seventh, in the 7th century, it was a crucially important identity, especially in Egypt, but it vanished. So this is an example of identity which has vanished. The Maximites, uh, those are the Byzantines who uh, supported the teaching of Maximus the Confessor in the 7th century. Uh, this is probably another identity that I would pick up for myself as well. Uh, uh, and again, it was initially a pejorative identity, completely pejorative. It was like an accusation, like you are Maximite, you are fool or yeah, that person. But eventually it turned into a very positive identity. So, for instance, myself, in myself, I would like to I would, uh, subscribe to that identity. And, and I'm sure that a lot of the uh, Catholic, for instance, uh, theologians or just faithful would subscribe to this identity as well, easily. The Maronites, well, now it is a group in union with Rome who live mostly in, in the Lebanon, in, in Cyprus. But this is a group which is also has its name from the name of the Maron, of the Hassan, a monk who lived in, in Syria in some obscure times. It's still impossible to identify one exactly who lived, but he gave its name to this group. So another example. Portians. Portians, this is another pejorative identity that the uh, Western church, the Western uh, theologians, uh, ascribed to the Byzantines. So when it was hard in the relationship between the West and the East, between Constantinople and Rome, and we were on the brink of the schism, of the great schism, the Westerners called us the Portians, after the name of the patriarch of Constantinople Portians. It's interesting that we in the East never called the Westerners after any name in the West. Uh, we had other bad words for the Westerners, like uh, Latins or France. Lutherans, another identity which uh, derives from the name of the theologian Luther, or Luther, it's well, German, but it's Luther. Okay. Calvinists, the same, after Jean Calvin. And this is very much uh, the same as the, the identities that we know about from the New Testament. Uh, remember, when Paul writes to the Corinthians that each of one, each one of you say, says, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. So that Divisions, that kind of divisions existed already in the early church. The divisions associated with the names, the identities that emerged from uh, the names of the leaders of the group. Uh, it's interesting that Christ himself, Jesus Christ, Christ himself, uh, it seems never used, never implied, never suggested any identity for his disciples. He never, never called him anything that would function as an identity for the group of the disciples. He, he never even called them apostles. The only identity that he implied was the identity of the disciples. 
when he several times a few times mentioned that you are my disciples or you what the disciples should do. So the disciples is probably the only identity that the Christ himself implied. But otherwise, he tried to destroy the contemporary identities on which people in his time wrote. Say he challenged the identity of the Pharisees. It's a, it was a group identity that defined a group of the people within the Jewish community. Or he challenged the identity of the Samaritans when he breached the gap that existed at the time between the Jews and other Semitic groups like, like, like Samaritans, for instance. So Christ himself, it seems, tried to destroy, to deconstruct identities because those identities uh, did not help his uh, mission uh, because the identities, it, se it seems, at the time, yes, they consolidated groups. They made people subscribing to some causes, but eventually they contributed to divisions within the same people, within, within the same community. That's why Christ challenged those identities. But it came again <coughs> soon after Christ uh, uh, ascended to the heaven. After the Christian community began living on its own, then uh, those group identities emerge like mushrooms. And Apostle Paul exactly addresses this issue that he writes in the Philippians. That's why, just if you take those identities named after the, the, the theologians, and you see uh, they are similar to the identities which are mentioned by Paul in his. A letter to the Corinthians like Paul's, like Apollos's, like Cephas's, and so forth. Okay? Uh, bless you. Uh, let us continue with the identities. Let us come back to the modern identity. These are old ones that survived, many of them survived, and many of them still exist today and define people and groups of people within the Eastern world, Eastern Christian world. Uh, but there are some new identities uh, that pretend to be old, but they were constructed uh, recently. Let's come back to our list of the cloud, of our cloud of identities. And let us add some more to this list. Uh, this is uh, an identity which is not connected with the uh, with any name. Uh, it is an identity how the Oriental groups remember those who stayed outside Byzantium, uh, like Armenians, Copts. Uh, Ethiopians, Syrians, and so forth. That's how they call the Byzantine Christians. They call they call them Melkites, uh, which is a Semitic word for the king, the people of the king. They were the people who had alliance, loyalty to the Byzantine Empire. Okay, this is an identity that stems from the political uh, institution. The Chalcedonite identity. Uh, this identity comes from the Council of Chalcedon, the council that was held in the 5th century and that, that actually uh, tried to reconcile different groups in the church but eventually contributed to the final schism between the Byzantine Christianity and the Oriental Christianity. All these, all the, all the, all the Christologists, all the identification, who and what is Christ. Okay? So this identity is uh, stems from the council, from a particular council, not just from the phenomenon of the council's conciliarity, remember, but from a particular council which was held in the fifth century. The monophysites, uh, we in return, the Chalcedonites, the Byzantine Christians, call those who did not accept the council of Chalcedon monophysites because they believe in one nature of Christ, in one Jesus of Christ. This identity string is still very strong about the Orientals. And this, this has become a major issue for discussions. When we come to the dialogue with the Oriental churches, 
the Byzantine churches with the Oriental churches. We some we, we often discuss this issue of identity, whether we call them monophysites or it is not good to call them monophysites. Actually, uh, uh, they don't like very much nowadays this uh, this identity, and they prefer to this identity uh, another one which is a bit modified from this neophysites. They say we are not monophysites; we are neophysites, which is absolutely the same. Monophysites is uh, from the word Greek monos and thesis. Monos which means one and thesis means nature. And what they say we are neophysites, which is near thesis. Near is the same word as monos. Near means one, but it's more correct because it is uh, feminine. This is a feminine noun, and this uh, 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 this word is in, in, in feminine uh, 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 clause as well. So it is it is not correct, but the same meaning, and they constitute completely different identities. This identity, the uh, uh, Oriental churches don't like it. This identity they like it. You see, in in the meaning they are the same. But as identities, they function completely different. And people get upset about this one, and they're happy about this one. So this indicates that identities sometimes uh, have nothing to do with their meanings, their original meanings. Identities sometimes live separately from their original meaning. And it makes it harder to deal with identities, because then you have to, to, to deal with cultural phenomena and not theological or philosophical phenomena. Okay. Uh, then another schismatic identity. That's how the Catholic theologians and, and mostly ordinary people called us, the Easterners, for centuries. It, it had, well, it continued until the, I don't know, the Vatican II. And it was very common that, uh, well, they just called us schismatics. Schismatics mean those who are in schism, in, who are separated from Rome, from the Pope. And because we, were, we are separated from Rome, we are schismatics. And of course, we don't like this at all. Well, another, another kind of pejorative identity that has been ascribed to the Eastern as this Caesar of East. They say, you don't do it in Pope, but for you, the emperor is like the Pope. That's what Caesar, Caesar of Athis means. That you Orthodox venerate your emperors like we, the Catholics, venerate our Pope. And this is, of course, this is a misjudgment for both perspectives. Uh, but it has been an identity and it functioned as an identity for quite a while. And we return to the Westerners uh, another pejorative identity, Papa Caesaris, that for you the Pope is like a Caesar, like a political figure. And this is also a misjudgment, certainly a misrepresentation of what the Catholic Church believes, but this pejorative identity functioned as uh, a kind of a divisive uh, uh, instrument. Okay. Well, we are called nationalists. Many of us are nationalists, certainly. Uh, but sometimes the identity of nationalists <coughs> is, uh, applies to also to the entire uh, tradition. The same is with Greek. Identity Armenian, Syrian and Assyrian. This is really interesting, Syrian and Assyrian. Now, uh, I taught for quite a lot in Sweden, and uh, I taught to the people from the local community of the refugees from Syria and Iraq. And their identity, they come from the same milieu, from the same context, from the same country, and they really can stand each other on the basis of how they identify themselves. There is one group who says, 
we are Syrians, and there is another who says we are Assyrians, and they're just ready to kill each other. Uh, they were not killed by Saddam, but they're ready to kill each other just over this identity. You know, this is really uh, strange that it has also religious roots. It has essentially to do with uh, with how you see this community. The Syrian, they say, some of them, some of them they say that to call ourselves Syrian is to accept some kind of uh, uh, Greek superiority over our, our, over our community. Uh, it has to do with the traumas that they have in relationship with Byzantine in the past millennium. So Syria means to be kind of uh, uh, great, uh, Hellenicized, to be under the Greek dominion, while Assyrian means to be free from Greek. We are not Greek because Assyrian is not a Greek word. Uh, the, the way how they were called by Greeks in, in the past millennium. So it has to do with the traumas, imperial, post colonial, whatever, traumas of the first millennium. And it still functions, uh, this divide, and uh, uh, it still influences the way how people identify themselves. Even in, in Sweden, a tiny group, just imagine how, uh, how, how, um, um, Almost immortal other other identities. All the backgrounds, all the historical reasons, sometimes all the philosophical or theological reasons die away, just fade away, get forgotten. But the identities remain, and they continue functioning as cultural uh, denominators. They still divide people. People have forgotten about what was the reason why those identities emerged, but they still struggle each other to the end. Well, so what can we uh, conclude from this? That uh, there is no, not a single identity that I at least can identify that was revealed from God. Every single identity was constructed. Even the identity of the Christians. You can say that the basic identity that unifies all of us Christians is the identity of being Christian. But still, even this identity has been constructed. As we know from the story, uh, about the early church, but according to the Acts of Apostles, the first, uh, 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 the early, the early Christian community, Antioch, called itself Christian, and it happened in the first century, certainly, but quite in the middle of the first century. So it was quite a late construction for the early Christianity. So the theological or philosophical value is minimal. And identities can be more powerful than theology or ideology or whatever, more than the service. So a philosophical system or theological system uh, gives birth to an identity, and then this identity can kill this tradition that gave birth to. Okay. Uh, and in this case, the identities function as cultural phenomena. We face uh, the, the strength, the power of this uh, phenomenon, of the phenomenon of identity uh, in the dialogue. For instance, I, I'm on the dialogue with the Oriental churches. And uh, with the Oriental churches, we have come to a complete theological agreement that we don't have differences in our uh, faith. But still, we cannot unite. We, we cannot uh, get united. We cannot become one church because the identities that were uh, that uh, the people created over centuries still function, still very strong, and prevent people from uh, getting united. The bishops say in the, in the dialogue, "We agree. We don't have any problem with you, the Chalcedonians. Let us unite." But the moment I go back to my flock, to Egypt or to Syria, and tell them that those bloody Chalcedonians will be again with us, one church, they will kill me. Because uh, they have to do with identities. They were, they, they were uh, nourished uh, with, uh, uh, they were brought up with the idea that the Chalcedonians are, you know, they eat the babies. And uh, you cannot get rid of this identity easily. 
you cannot have a reasonable argument to challenge to challenge them. You cannot, uh, you know, persuade people easily. You have to. Uh, you have to. I don't know what you have to do actually to the constructors. I don't have no idea. Maybe you have it. Yes, please. Why do you think there is like such a culture of social? Oh, um, yes, it's a good question. Uh, well, people like to be divided. Uh, uh, sometimes what happened in the post millennium, people didn't have proper political mechanisms of uh, expressing their political desire, their political agenda. There were no words, vocabulary, there were no instruments like parliament or like parties or whatever. They used theology to translate to theology of their political agenda. So, uh, for instance, uh, all of they, they used uh, sports, and actually sports and theology came together. It's interesting that in Constantinople, there were two major sport teams, the Greens and the Blues. They, uh, they participated in the aerial races, okay, in the stadium, in the hippodrome. And uh, they deadly hated each other. Uh, uh, they actually killed each other from time to time. Uh, but they functioned not just as sport teams, they functioned as theological groups. So each of, the, of those groups had a, a particular theological agenda. For instance, the Greens uh, were against the Chalcedon, the Blues were for the Chalcedon, for the Chalcedon. And they have political agendas. So they expressed through sport and theology that were two uh, uh, accessible means for the people of the time, for the society of the time, to, to promote their political views and agendas to do so. And this is how the theological agenda intertwined with the political agenda become, became heavily charged politically. And when you now uh, and well, people are divided politically, well, in this country and any country, right, right? But they express this division by going to vote for a certain party. Okay, they don't kill each other, you don't kill each other, you don't need to, you know, to have theological arguments against each other. Maybe in this country it's different because uh, far right uh, political movements, but still, normally it's, uh, it's not the case. You can believe in what you believe, right? But then you go to vote uh, because you have certain political uh, ideas and you don't need to bring your beliefs to, to the voting uh, process, uh, right? Booths. Uh, in that time, it was not the case because there were no political instruments detached from religion. You had to bring your religion if you had a political agenda, right? And uh, that's why the natural political divisions express themselves in the theological divisions. And then the theological di divisions became a value in themselves, became identities. They lost their political rationale, their theological rationale, and they continued to function also, or only as, uh, as uh, identities, which still divide people. They, they have become falsified. They have become really father. Okay. Uh, so let us come back to our cloud of identities and let us consider two particular identities. One is the Orthodox one, which is the main identity for us nowadays. Let us have a brief look into it. Well, the English word orthodoxy comes from a Greek word which consists of two words, orthos and orthiel, which means I think correctly. Uh, Dokeo means not just, you know, I believe, or better to say, it does mean I believe, it means I have an opinion. Okay? So orthodoxy it means that I have an opinion, opinion, my personal opinion. And I believe it is right, it is correct. That's what about the authors uh, and how, how you decode this word. 
Uh, Dokeo uh, means primarily this, but orthodoxia is often interpreted as the right way of worshiping, the right way of addressing God. Uh, this is not a, an exact meaning of the, of the word orthodoxy, but still an acceptable interpretation of the uh, of the notion of orthodoxy. And there is no controversy between two uh, ideas, the right way of thinking and the right way of worshipping. Because for the Eastern tradition, the two things are uh, connected with each other. And uh, uh, a, theologian, a theologian who lived in the 4th century, Evagrius of, Pont of Pontus, has expressed this in a very nice and elegant way. He said, if you are a theologian, you will pray truly. And you, if you pray truly, you are a theologian. So he actually connected the way how we worship with the way how we think. And uh, that's why, from this perspective, at least, orthodoxy could mean both uh, things uh, the right way of thinking and right way of praying. Uh, nevertheless, as any other identity, this one has been constructed. And it had its, polit its political and historical reasons for being constructed. So we may believe that we are orthodox, and it has been forever like that, always. Uh, but it is not the case, because even this identity uh, emerged uh, under certain circumstances in the past. It particularly it became particularly strong uh, in the course of the uh, so-called iconoclasm. It, uh, it, uh, it happened in the 8th and 9th centuries in Byzantium, when the emperors suddenly decided to destroy the icons. And it was our own kind of uh, version of Reformation, if you want. But it happened it happened seven centuries before the global Reformation. Uh, there are different uh, interpretations why this happened. Uh, one of the interpretations is that uh, it happened under the pressure of Islam, because Islam was very much against icons, and the Byzantines, in order to deal with Islam, which was spreading rapidly, also tried to uh, also tried to comply with this uh, with this tendency. Uh, nevertheless, this um, phenomenon, historical phenomenon of iconoclasm, was rejected eventually. It was not accepted by the church and by the people, and. Uh, this was celebrated as a piece of the triumph of orthodoxy. Since then, the idea of orthodoxy has become uh, particularly strong as an identity in the piece. So you see, it is quite recent now in terms, at least, of the uh, history of the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, so this celebration of victory over iconoclasm gradually turned uh, into an identity, and we still live with this identity. Okay. Uh, so they produce special, uh, special uh, genre of literature, the so-called Sinovitao for policy, where they commemorate all the uh, orthodox uh, patriarchs, kings, dead and alive, and uh, they condemn the heresies and so forth. So this, these instruments helped a celebration of orthodoxy to develop into an identity. So we don't go into much detail with this. I just want to say that uh, uh, this identity arrived timely at the time when the tensions between the East and the West uh, exacerbated, exacerbated and uh, eventually led to the Great Schism to the separation between the Eastern and the Western Church. And uh, this separation between the Eastern and the Western Church enhanced the Orthodox identity in the East. It was enhanced even more in, uh, uh, during the Reformation, when the Christianity in Europe became uh, confessionalized, when the confessions became more important than uh, being one church. And this happened exactly beginning in the 16th century with the Reformation. And this internal struggle in the West affected also the Eastern churches, which embarked on the same argument, and they tried to identify themselves vis-a-vis -vis the Catholics and the Protestants. 
and they uh, more and more increasingly identify themselves with this orthodox identity. And this was an upgrade from the orthodox identity of the 11th century. You see, so you see at least three waves of development of this identity. One way was iconoclasm, another way was uh, the great schism, and the third way uh, was the European Reformation. Uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, the orthodox identity is not the only one, because we in the East also identify ourselves as Catholics. We say we are the Catholic Church. The famous uh, Catechism of the uh, Moscow in the beginning of the 19th century stated uh, who or what is the Orthodox Church in the Russian Empire. And this is a, you know, a bunch of identities that we put together Orthodox, Catholic, Eastern, Greek, Russian Church. None of these identities was uh, ancient enough. Everyone, every single identity was uh, constructed in. Uh, under certain historical circumstances. And it's interesting that we say that we are Catholic Church uh, only when we say that the Catholic Church is a Roman Catholic Church. So we try not to mix the two identities. Uh, and another, uh, well, another thing about this, uh, uh, this identity, orthodox identity, is that uh, uh, in the period when the doctrine of the church was developing, the orthodoxy of the church was uh, 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 was uh, articulated. The church had a different identity. It did not call itself very much orthodox. Well, it did call itself orthodox. Certainly, it was one of the identities, but it was not a major identity. The major identity of the Christians at the time, when the Orthodox identity was in formation, uh, it was the identity of Romans. The Christians in the East, uh, in the first millennium, called themselves Romans. Uh, uh, and it's interesting because uh, in the second century, they became, they embarked gradually on the identity of the non-Romans, not like the Roman Church, not non-Westerners, Easterners. So you see how the identity from uh, one point transferred to the opposite point, from the point of being Roman to the point, point of being non-Roman. And, uh, uh, and it's important to remember that the basic, the most important identity, what the Orthodox identity is for us today, in the first millennium, the same identity for them, for the Easterners, was the Roman identity. They called themselves Romans. Uh, uh, and this was both political and religious identity. Rome is a, is a city, right? And moreover, the city of Rome was in the West. It did not belong to the part of the empire that the Easterners lived in, but it was a part of the Roman Empire. It was a Roman Empire, and therefore the identity of the people was Roman, and it was both political and religious. Uh, if they were asked, how do you believe? They would answer, I, I believe like Romans do. Okay? And for the, for the uh, foreigners, the Orthodox, which were, who were not Orthodox yet, who had not yet this Orthodox identity, but they were Romans, for the foreigners, they were also Romans. So the Arabs in the seventh century called them Aru, which means Romans. And interestingly, that even there is a surah in Quran which speaks about the Romans, and, and it is titled Aru, the Romans. And it's a uh, it's called the Surah Aru. It's interesting that this surah is dedicated to a particular case when the Byzantines were defeated in Antioch in the beginning of the, seventh, uh, of the sixth century by the Persians. The Byzantines were monotheists for the Arabs. The Persians were polytheists, were pagans, right? And it was a shock 
for the Arabs, this defeat. They say how uh, polytheistic pagan religion can defeat the monotheistic religion, right? And they try to figure out, well, to, to make sense of this from the perspective of the providence, of the divine providence. And they, the surah then says that, no, the Byzantines eventually will win, will prevail. Okay, so the surah endorsed the Byzantines, even though they were not Muslims, but they were monotheists, that they should, the, the, there is a plan of God for the Byzantines eventually to win over the pagan uh, Christians. Okay, and, in, and it's uh, uh, important to understand, remember that the Byzantines in this surah were called Romans. Okay, um, well, in the Turkish Ottoman Empire, which was formative for the entire Orthodox world uh, during the second century, the uh, uh, Eastern Christians were also called Milet Iru, which means um, a, a Roman people. The Turkish Empire was divided into religious groups. There were Muslims and there were religious minorities. Each of them had political autonomy uh, and they were uh, built around their religious identity. The, the Byzantine Orthodox were called Milet uh, Irun. Uh, the uh, North Chalcedonian, the Oriental uh, um, uh, group, was called the Armenians. Uh, there were, and they included also Syrians. Syrians. There was a Jewish group, and um, eventually, uh, in the 19th century, a Catholic group was recognized within the Ottoman uh, Empire. So, uh, even in the Ottoman setting. Uh, up to the beginning of the 20th century, the, the Byzantines, the Orthodox, were called Romans. Uh, even now, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, which is uh, located in Istanbul, uh, its Turkish name is Rum Orthodox Patriarchate. Uh, so it's still Roman Patriarchate. Okay? It's interesting that there is the Patriarch of Patriarchate of Rome in Rome, and there is the Patriarchate of the Roman Patriarchate in Constantinople at least from the Turkish perspective. And it's interesting, if you go to a Greek village, which is not affected very much by, by the modern uh, national propaganda of Greece, because Greece has created a new identity for itself in the 19th century, and uh, uh, there are villages that, are, that remain unaffected by this identity. Uh, you find people who identify themselves as Romans there. They call themselves, we are we, they are Romans, or they. And there is, I just recorded for you, downloaded for you, a nice song that was recorded in 1950, where they think about themselves as Romans. We don't have much time to listen to it, I'm going to a nice book. Uh, and the last identity I wanted to, to explore, if we don't have again much time, but I hope to say a few words about it, is the tradition. Well, tradition is, is not just a tradition, it is also an identity, and it does function as an identity. And, uh, Tradition has become a, a kind of a big word, it, and it, it means too many things. And because it means too many things, sometimes it means nothing. Uh, but this is now. In the past, it meant very simple things, down to earth, very practical ones. Uh, there are two, two versions of the word, the Greek and the Latin, they are completely identical. And they come from, you know, this is the etymology of this word. The Latin word traditio comes from the tradere, which means to transmit to deliver in the same as what they do for paradisus, uh, from the word from the verb paradinomi. And in, the, in those settings, this word meant very simple things. In the Latin, it meant, uh, for instance, uh, the way how I came into a possession of the property. In the Roman world, people didn't sign you know, agreements and of selling property, whatever. They just gave a key to another person. And the way how, and uh, by the fact that I give a key from the property, from a shop or from the house, 
uh, I, I transmit the possession over this property to another person. Now, this process of transmission of possession uh, was the tradition. In Greek, it meant also a very simple thing. For instance, when the athletes, the runners in the marathon, just pass the apartment uh, to each other, this was the process of tradition. They transmitted this apartment to another runner. So that was the tradition as well. Well, in the Jewish world, it is really an important uh, thing. Um, I remember um, I participated in the dialogue with the Jewish community in, in, in Jerusalem. It was very nice. Uh, excellent. We were hosted by the chief rabbi of Israel, and uh, they were, you know, some kind of uh, the most important sages of Israel who came to this dialogue, you know, long bearded, and with uh, like. Uh, you can not find the father age and so forth. And uh, we were sitting on two sides of the table, and on both sides of the table, they were talking about the same, about the tradition, how to develop the tradition. And it was like this. Oh, no. I just wanted to show you the fragment of the movie, and if you were on the roof, probably you've, you've seen it, some of you. Some of you. Uh, it doesn't work, but. I'll show you maybe in the end if we have time. So it's uh, also important for the Jewish world. Um, in the Greek world, if you come to the tradition, also had a hint of tragedy. It was a tragedy. Uh, there is an interesting novel, a romance, written in the second century. It's called uh, uh, Kereas and Kaliroi. Perez was a guy, and Kairoi was um, uh, a beauty. I, I, I'm really surprised that no one has made a movie on the basis of, them, of this one. It's really uh, striking. Just imagine this beauty, Kairoi, she was just an extremely beautiful uh, lady. Uh, she married the guy, uh, this Kairoi's. He mistreated her because uh, he believed the accusation that she was not faithful to him. Uh, he uh, saw her, she fell, uh, fell into coma. He thought that she is in coma, she's died, she buried her to, to, to the tomb. She woke up in the tomb just like a year. Uh, and she was found there by pirates. Pirates brought her to um, uh, Asia Minor, sold her to, sold her to, um, to a local ruler. The local ruler married her. She had, by the, by the time she was pregnant from Seroyes, she gave birth to, to, to a baby who was dark before the, this baby is his. Uh, in the meantime, she was learned that this lady uh, was alive, went to find her. In the meantime, the Persian was started, and, and uh, um, uh, the Persian king uh, um, captured the territory. Uh, the two, the Seroes and the king who married for the second time, Kaliroi, were called to the Persian court to be judged who is her husband. The Persian king decided who is the husband and decided to take this woman for himself to marry her. Uh, eventually, there was a big revolt against the Persians, and uh, the first guy, the first husband, participated in the revolt. Uh, uh, he won over the Persians, he took uh, a Kaliroi back with her, they reunited happily, came back to their home, lived happily again. So it's really a drama. When, when I read it, it was just, wow, it's just a ready scenario for you know, a world trust. <laughs> Anyways, all this story was called a tradition uh, in, in this novel. The drama, the tragedy, when Kaliroi uh, was in the tomb, she, uh, she just complains about how she was mistreated. So she says, this is a tragedy, okay? Uh, a tradition, excuse me, a tradition. So uh, the Greek grammaturgy uh, uh, considered tradition as a drama, as a tragedy. The same is in the Gospels. Because when we see the story about how Christ was treated or mistreated and how he was betrayed in the Gospels, it is described as a tradition, as the way how he was betrayed. 
uh, Christ himself when he spoke about tradition, he, uh, uh, he, he spoke about it with, uh, with criticism. Um, so this was really uh, this was really uh, uh, a, a kind of a negative and uh, negative. It had a negative connotation with Moscow's the very notion of tradition. And eventually, the Christian community embarked on the tradition as an important uh, feature of itself, regardless of those connotations that, that existed in the in the gospel. Um, uh, and uh, in these remaining five minutes, I uh, just want to say a few words about the dialects of the of the uh, acceptance of tradition by the Christian community. How the Christian community accepted the tradition, became made it an identity, and uh, how identity this identity actually uh, uh, reduces Christianity. To some pieces, to the some fragments, to uh, some fragmented ideas about Christianity. Um, the right, uh, there is an idea that when we speak about traditions, we should distinguish between the tradition with capital T and traditions with small things. Uh, the tradition with capital T is something important, is something big, is something uh, which we should uh, take into consideration. Well, uh, and, uh, and should be living. Uh, while traditions with smoky is something which are like rituals, like habits, like customs, that should not be, uh, that, should, that, do, that, that do not have the same authority. They should be probably uh, somehow respected, but not to the same extent as the big tradition. And uh, this idea was articulated but by, uh, in, in very similar way by two theologians. One, one is the Catholic, the Inca. Uh, Ethan Gar, French uh, theologian, and the other one is a Russian theologian and quotation in France, the university. He both, they both spoke about the tradition with capital T and traditions with small t. Uh, I will not now quote them, just uh, I will not pass this one. It's complicated. I just want to say that uh, as any identity, the identity of tradition functions in, 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 uh, in, uh, in an ambivalent way in, in the Christian community. On the one hand, it, it helps keeping the community together, the people together. On the other hand, it can harm the community, it can harm the uh, church. Uh, and uh, the tradition with when, uh, capital T is important as it helps the, the community to, to be together. The traditions, when they divide the community, they uh, lead to what is called uh, traditionalism. Uh, anything which, which has uh, the suffix is, is, is not is not what is good. Right? It, is not good. it is an ideological bias, um, kind of uh, a lack of uh, sufficient reason. Uh, lack of privacy, and uh, this is uh, this this exactly what happens when we treat the traditions as some as something sacrosanct, as something which is uh, 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 which is equal to to Christianity itself. Uh, there is a nice nice saying in one in, uh, from the book that you uh, uh, you are supposed to read for the next time. The book of Yaroslav Pelikan, who said, Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Tradition is the dead faith of the living. So I think it gives you a clear idea of what is a living 